Uh, my name is Sarah Giddings. The first time I tried to kill myself, I was 16 years old. Uh, my name is Terry Tottenham. As I was nearing my 60th birthday, I faced a personal and professional crisis that drove me into a deep depression and caused me to consider and look at my long history of alcohol abuse. My name is Tracy Franklin Squires. I'm an assistant district attorney, and I'd like to tell the story of my family's loss of my brother Donald to suicide. I'm Terry Bentley Hill. I'm a criminal defense attorney from Dallas, Texas, and I am a survivor of suicide. I am not a survivor just once, I'm a survivor twice. My first husband took his life 25 years ago, and then nine years later, my precious youngest daughter, who was 14 years old, also took her life. My name's Ann Ritchie. I have bipolar disorder, and I'm a suicide attempt survivor. My name is Kyrie Cameron, and my life has been significantly affected by suicide and depression. My name is Sally Conway. I'm the executive director of the Grace Long Car Foundation. Brian was a huge part of my life growing up from the time I was little until I was an adult. Uh, he was an extremely involved stepfather. He even coached my uh, elementary school soccer team. Um, four years ago, this November, we lost Brian tragically a week after we lost my youngest sister, Grace, to suicide. We lost Brian to an overdose. I'm Erica Gregg. I've been practicing law since 2001, and I absolutely loved my work. It was exciting, um, it was challenging, it was adventurous, but along with the challenges and adventure came depression and anxiety. And 10 years ago, on Mother's Day, I attempted to take my own life. I'm Chris Ritter, and I'm the director of the Texas Lawyers Assistance Program. And I can't tell you how much it means to me today to share with you some life-saving information about depression and suicide. Depression is the biggest problem that we face as attorneys. And if we don't know how to take care of it, how to recognize it, it can lead to death by suicide. Anxiety is something that attorneys face every day. Anxiety over time, if we don't know how to take care of ourselves, can lead to depression. And if we don't know what to do or how to recognize depression, uh, we can get into a serious problem. I remember I was driving out to my parents' house down these winding roads, and I remembered thinking, you know what? All I would have to do to end it all would be to drive off one of these roads into one of these canyons. And that Mother's Day night, that's exactly what I did. The best year of my life, professionally and on paper, was 2007. I had won my first uh, Super Lawyers Rising Star Award. I'd made partner. I was working in winning cases, winning trials. And I was doing a lot. And I was on boards, uh, charitable boards. And I can tell you, that was actually the worst year of my life. I have never been more miserable than I was in 2007. And on the outside, I looked like everything was great. On the inside, I didn't want to exist. I felt, um, you know, at the time, looking back, you know, I had a great childhood. I don't fault my parents for, you know, any of my issues with depression. Um, I was top of my class, you know, I was in extracurricular activities, I had a loving family but just life, I didn't feel like I was good enough. And so the first time I tried to kill myself, I took um, 62 sleeping pills um, with the hopes that I'd go to sleep and never wake up again. My story with respect to depression and suicide begins uh, in 1973 when I was 28 years old, three years out of law school and working at Baker Botts. Uh, I felt like at that stage I was at the top of the world, uh, doing what I wanted to do, learning uh, to be a trial lawyer. And then uh, over a period of several weeks, uh, my life took a turn that uh, totally shocked me. I couldn't understand what was going on. Gradually, 
My feelings went down, down, down. I had never felt that sort of thing before and eventually ended up uh, in the dark hole, uh, hopeless, not believing that things would ever get better and started feeling and thinking about suicide. She spent the night out. She was very intelligent. She had lots of friends who liked her. She had everything, it appeared. But one of the things she said is, nobody sits with me at the, at the lunch table. And I thought, I know that's not true. So I'm gonna volunteer in the, in the cafeteria and I'm gonna see if she's sitting all by herself in the cafeteria. Sure enough, she had 20 people sitting around her at the lunch table. So I proved her wrong, by golly, that she had tons of friends, but it was irrelevant what I thought. It's what she thought. And she was thinking she had no friends, that everybody would be better off without her. And that is what my former husband told me. Everyone would be better off without me. You will find another husband. There will be a, your, our kids will have a better father. He was saying all of those black or white, all or nothing words, and I missed them because I didn't speak the language of depression. And the second time I tried to kill myself, I was in um, college. And I was kind of at the point of, you know, I was ready to apply for law school. I knew where I was going in my life. But instead, you know, all I could think of was, I'm such a disappointment. I'm such a failure. I don't know why any, anybody would want to support me. Anybody would want me to be their lawyer if I went to law school. What was the point? And I tried to kill myself again. My brother was always sort of what people referred to as troubled. He got in trouble a lot in school and had a lot of problems with his behavior um, and really struggled in his life, in his short young life. Um, he had a hard time with emotional regulation and emotional control and he had attempted suicide a year before he died. He had used some pills um, and he had been found and taken to the hospital. And I think my family didn't really take it very seriously because we felt like if he was actually trying to kill himself that he would have used something other than pills. But at this time, my family didn't know anything about suicide and suicide prevention and how these things work. And we didn't know that actually, in truth, once someone has attempted suicide, their likelihood of completing suicide goes up quite dramatically. I remember a Friday night, Ryan came home. We had like an at-home date night on Friday nights. And I remember him telling me, almost in casual conversation, that he just really hated being a lawyer. And when he said it, it took my breath away because I was shocked. He loved the law. He was so excited to begin his dream career that it almost didn't seem real to me. And I can't imagine what my face looked like, but probably shocked at the time. Um, but Ryan just said, I really hate being a lawyer, Kyrie. Sometimes I just want to jump off the roof of that place. Almost just in passing. And I thought, oh, no way. And I remember saying something like, oh, I understand. You know, we all have bad days. Being a lawyer is not always fun, uh, but it'll get better. You know, I, I think I even said, I remember being eight months into practicing law before I felt like, oh, I had a good day today. I knew what I was doing. And so it truly, um, I didn't understand the depths of his pain. And then on December 5th of 2018, I came home from work and Ryan had taken his own life in our backyard. Um, he had left work kind of abruptly in the middle of the afternoon and went home and took his own life. I have a friend who attempted suicide when he was 17 years old. And he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and he survived to tell the story. And so I said, Kevin, what were you thinking? And he said, oftentimes when a person is suicidal, they'll make a pact with themselves. If this happens today, I won't die today. Might die tomorrow, but I won't die today. And he told me his entire day, the day he decided to die, he, t he went through the entire day of, of interacting with people. He was sobbing, 
uh, hugging his father for the last time, he thought. Getting on a bus crowded with people and he was crying and nobody asked him, are you okay? Getting to the bridge and a lady walking up to him and instead of asking, are you okay? She hands him a camera and says, take my picture. And he said, yeah, sure, I'll take your picture. And he jumped. But the thing he told me is that if one person had asked him if he was okay, he would not have jumped. And again, I also have to say that he, that the minute he jumped, he regretted it. And he said the saddest thing in the four seconds it took for him to hit the water is that he was going to die and his family did not know that he wanted to live. He regretted it the minute he jumped. So the minute he told me that, I thought, we have to stop minding our own business. We have to ask the question, are you okay? Even if it's a total stranger, I walk through that courthouse and it's not a happy place. If there's somebody on the bench crying, I will stop, because I remember what he said. If one person had asked me if I was okay, he wouldn't have taken his life, he wouldn't have jumped. So going to school to be a therapist, um, self-care was pushed. The importance of self-care was always there. Make time for yourself. If you start to feel overwhelmed, uh, reach out to someone. Don't hold it in. You have to have a support group. Don't isolate. Be open to change and things like that. So it was very a big push for self-care. And also the big push was if you lack self-care for yourself, how are you going to help others? And that same thing applies to law. But the difference is like starting from law school on, it is a big push, it's a marathon, it's a push to the end. I've got to learn this law, I've got to make good grades, I've got to get an internship. After you finish, I've got to study for the bar, I've got to pass the bar. Now that you're done, I've got to get a job, I've got to do this, and everything is so pressing. And then it's one thing to another to another. And so it's hard, you get into that mode and it's hard to get out of that. So depression is this uh, state of mind where uh, out of the blue, uh, one loses the interest and enthusiasm for things that normally uh, interested them. Uh, it may get to a point where they're feeling tired most of the time and uh, uh, may essentially uh, affect their uh, appetite and sleep. You know, people may not have much of an appetite, the sleep may end up being uh, interrupted and, and not as restful as, as normally. Uh, it's harder to focus. And uh, at the extreme of that, you know, people may develop this feeling that uh, nothing is ever gonna change and that perhaps life is not worth living. In many instances, they may feel like they're a burden to their families and friends and society. And uh, if left untreated, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, some of those individuals will uh, end up dying by suicide. Grace struggled immensely with depression. And oftentimes, untreated depression will and can lead to suicide, which is why it is so important that people that struggle with mental illness, is whether it be depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia get the help they need because left untreated they can be fatal and oftentimes in the form of suicide. You absolutely should ask if you feel like something is going on with a person. Research in fact shows that asking the question about suicide actually helps. It doesn't plant the seed of suicide in someone's head who's never thought about it. So what it does is show the person that you've noticed what's going on with them. You care enough to have noticed what's going on with them. I think people are worried that if you ask someone about suicide that you've put the idea in their mind. Nobody ever put the idea in my mind that I needed to kill myself or should try to kill myself. That was already already there. Um, you know, I think the worst thing is the you notice that something's off and you never say anything, right? I always tell people it's, it's really hard to have those hard conversations with those hard conversations save lives, not the, oh, you don't seem like yourself. I mean, that's really easy to pass off and you can say, I'm fine or I'm okay. It's the, have you thought about killing yourself? It makes me think, man, this person, I'm not doing as good as I thought I was showing people that I'm okay. And then I examine what's really going on and hopefully leads to another conversation. 
If you think about a suicidal crisis, it's like a balloon that's filling up with air. And by asking the right questions and, and, not, and not asking them judgmentally, but because you're concerned and validating their feelings, then oftentimes you can reduce that suicidal crisis and it deflates some of that balloon. And, and, the, and what we want to do is we want get to people to pause. We want them to pause. If the answer is maybe, or I don't know, maybe I've thought about it in passing, we stop and we listen. And it's very important that we let them talk as much as possible. And if anything makes us think that they are more suicidal than we think, we get them connected to a mental health professional immediately. And the most important situation is if they say yes, they are thinking about it, they have thought about it, and they describe that they've even had a plan. When we talk to someone and say, hey, have you thought about suicide? And the answer is yes. We stay present as long as it's safe to do so, and we commit to staying with them, and we get 911 involved. If it's, we call 911 and we ask for the mental health team and we tell 911 that we have a suicide, suicidal situation. If it's safe to do so, we take action to restrict means. We never endanger ourselves when we help people, but we, we connect them immediately to immediate help. If safe to do so, we can take them to the emergency room. But at minimum, we call 911 and allow those professionals to take over. The first thing that if somebody came to me and is telling me that they have suicidal thoughts, I want to listen. I want to listen to their burdens. I want to listen to their struggles. I want to listen to their fears. And then the second thing I want to do is connect them with a professional. Never stop looking. Call a stranger. Talk to anybody. Don't say, this is the last person I'm going to try. Say. I'm going to try one more person. I'm going to try calling one more person. I'm going to go to the drugstore and I'm going to talk to a complete stranger. I'm going to pick up the suicide crisis line and the phone and call suicide crisis line. I'm going to call somebody. I'll call 911. I'll call whoever, but I'll call somebody and I will get some help. And so I want their legacy to be that life is worth fighting for, that sobriety is worth fighting for and allowing people to do that, to, to come to your aid and to provide you the support and resources needed to help fight depression or to fight addiction or to fight bipolar disorder. Because I think that the tragedy of our losses is that they didn't get the help that they needed and so I want people to know that the consequence of not getting the help that you need is not just your heart breaking, but breaking the hearts of those that love you. But medication takes a while to work. That's why you have to keep doing the next right thing. You have to put the, your foot, one foot in front of the other. You have to get up and make your bed every day. You have to take those right steps, and eventually you, the medical community, the support community, and the clinicians can help you feel better. At age 60, after 32 years living under the stigma, feeling guilt and shame and not wanting anybody to know what had happened to me, uh, I decided to go public with my story. That was about 15 years ago and uh, it made a huge difference uh, for me. Uh, it was liberating. It enabled me to give back. There were two real goals that I had. One was to give back and try to help people who had been through some of the experiences I had been through. And secondly, to fight this stigma that I believe results from prejudice and discrimination that people have toward those of us who have uh, experienced uh, mental health challenges. 
So since that time, I've been able to uh, uh, help people. And uh, frankly, it's been some of the most uh, satisfying experiences in my life. If you see someone more reserved, they, they seem to be sad, uh, crying more often, lack, lacking uh, uh, the energy and enthusiasm and, and uh, just not their normal selves. It, it really has nothing to be uh, to do with being soft or being tough. And, and, I, and I'll tell you, so the, the, the biggest example, and there are many, but the biggest one that I've seen a few years back, uh, Terry Bradshaw, the Pittsburgh Steeler, uh, Steelers quarterback, he came to the American Psychiatric Association meeting to talk about his struggles with depression and anxiety. And he's been very public about it. And what Terry told uh, to this group of psychiatrists, and I was in the audience, he, he said that, you know, in those days, he somehow he could get himself together, go to the field and play. But once the game was over, you know, it was back to this, uh, you know, feeling of uh, 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 sadness and intense anxiety. And uh, so, so he, he, he's been through uh, some really, you know, dark uh, places with his uh, depression issues uh, till he eventually found treatment that helped. And treatment usually involves a combination of medications, antidepressant medications, as well as finding a good therapist, a counselor who will help you, you know, best manage the stressors in your life. Mental health issues are normal. I, I can't express it enough. The value in going to therapy is much more than just talking and getting your feelings out. You can find out what's the root cause of some of the things that are going on. All areas of your life are affected when you're dealing with mental health issues. And, and mental health issues can be something as simple as poor stress management and anger management. It can be on the more severe um, spectrum, such as depression and suicide and major anxiety, schizophrenia. But it also can just be something as simple as anger management, stress management, grief and loss that you're unable to cope with. It doesn't mean something is wrong with you. You know, when I was in the throes of my depression and my anxiety, it felt to me like a personal failure. I, I just didn't understand how the outside of my life could look so good, right? You know, the job, the family, the support, the success. I didn't understand how that could be working so well, but my insides still felt you know, twisted and tormented. And I, it felt like a personal failure. But the minute that I realized that I wasn't alone, and the minute that I reached out to someone else and asked for help was the minute that the light started showing up in my life again. And I cannot stress enough how important that realization was to me, that I wasn't alone, that I didn't have to do this alone, and that there was help available. Put the numbers of the suicide crisis lines in your phone. We should all know those numbers. The National Suicide Crisis Not Line is 1-800-273-TALK. And you can also text HOME to 741741, and you're gonna be able to talk to someone who knows about depression, suicide ideation, and, and um, anxiety disorder and they can help you in that situation. My advice would be very simple. Um, getting help is a sign of strength. It is not a showing of weakness. And help is available to you on a confidential, personal basis to get you the help that you need. You don't have to struggle in your loneliness and you don't have to struggle alone. I'm here with you and I know exactly what you're going through because depression is a medical condition that can be treated and there is a cure. I am in depression remission. I'm treating it with medication, I'm treating it with therapy, and I'm treating it with peer support because it provides a connection with people who know exactly what you're going through. Depression is a medical diagnosis. There should be no shame, absolutely no shame associated with depression. 80% of the time, depression is successfully treated. A medical diagnosis, just like cancer, just like diabetes. We all know folks that have been diagnosed with both of them. 
And what do they do? They go to the oncologist, they go to a physician, they get a treatment plan. People rally around them in support. We must start treating depression the exact same way. Treatment works. Left untreated, depression is chronic, progressive, and fatal. If you know somebody that needs help, please be their support and be their voice. 46% of legal professionals will struggle with depression at some point in their career. There is a suicide prevention lifeline that is 24-7 offering support and guidance. 1-800-273-TALK. Every state has a lawyer's assistance program, otherwise known as a lab. Some states call it lawyers concerned for lawyers and in others, lawyers helping lawyers. Labs are free, confidential, safe, supportive, 24 seven. We assist lawyers, judges, law students, and met more often than not also assist family members. The labs can help guide you on the best approach to have a conversation with somebody that you're concerned about. We offer professional resources, peer support, group support, and therapeutic opportunities. To locate the LAP in your state, all you need to do is Google LAP Directory ABA. Many of the folks that are employed by the LAPs are folks that have walked through darkness. We understand, we are your people, and we speak your language. If someone you know is struggling with depression, often they're unable to pick up a 500-pound phone and ask for help. Be their voice. It is your business. We are losing people in our profession and in our families to depression and suicide, and it must stop. The solution begins with you, and it begins today.